Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. This show has two extremes, from the horror of bad decision-making to the sweetness of a child's kindness. But we're starting with horror. Our first guest is LaSalle horror writer Christian Laforet. The first edition of his book, The Space Between Houses, successfully sold out, and the second edition will be available in the near future. Christian now has another book, all these crooked streets, and it's filled with people doing crazy things because of their bad decision making. Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to talk about the book and about the stories, but first of all, how did you develop a love of horror? Um, I mean, it goes back to my childhood. Um, I'm a big horror movie fan. I love horror movies. Um, I have an older brother, so when, when I was little and really too little to watch horror movies he was like the perfect horror movie age and uh, he babysat me a lot and so i had no choice so uh, <laughs> i just i grew to love them and then over the years it just it snowballed until i just that's all that's all i consume is horror stories yeah you don't have a, a thing about it being called horror you don't it's not sci-fi um no, I mean, there, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of different like subgenres of horror. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, there's a lot of I, like I enjoy sci-fi horror, um, but it, yeah, there, there is pretty clear lines separating uh, the, the genres. What was your first horror story? Can you remember how young you um, were when you first saw the first one? Oh, geez, definitely not for like a movie. I can remember the first horror story I read um, when I was five um i got a comic book and it was called fright night which was based on a movie from the 80s um but it was like a continuing stories of these people and it was it was issue five of fright night and it it was awesome it was this guy turned <laughs> into a spider and killed people it was amazing what's the attraction um i mean i think it's like the same i i just i, I love the way this horror stories unfold i mean but i think it's it's like people who go on roller coasters or go to yeah. on thrill rides it's that you know, the thrill you get from a good scary story. Uh, I mean, at this point, I've seen so many and I've taken in so many that it's it's more like I enjoy it just on like a story level at this point. It's not so scary anymore, but... I find if I watch horror stories and they have a really negative ending or like, if the, you know, if the bad person wins or if the devil wins, it really sort of freaks me out. Do you care? Um, I do, actually. I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of like... That's sort of like a newer thing you're seeing in horror where there's mm -hmm. like this, the bad guy wins, which I mean, I guess is more of a reflection of reality. But I mean, we we read to escape, right? And and we want the hero to win. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I, I prefer not so much in movies because it's such a small commitment of your time, but a novel. If I've been reading this thing for weeks and then the bad guy wins, like I'm not going to be happy. No, it's it's as though you get to the end and then it lets you down. Pretty much. Yeah. You feel kind of dirty afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Who are your influences? I have a lot. Like I said, I, I watch a lot of movies. So a lot of my storytelling and the, my my approach to telling stories is based very visually. Like I, I really picture these mm -hmm. things. Um, but other writers, I mean, of course, Stephen King is every every horror writer's influence, whether they admit it or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Stephen King, for sure. Some some modern writers, though, that I really look up to. Uh, Nick Cutter, um, a.k.a. Craig Davidson mm -hmm. and um, Adam Neville. He's a, a British writer. They're both great. They, they have very similar voices to my own. So what did your parents think about your horror fetish? <laughs> um, uh, you know what? Honestly, like um, the, my, my mom is, is super supportive. Um, you know, she she raised me, my mom. So um, <laughs> she, just whatever made me happy, made her happy. So that was that was pretty much the end of that. If, if I liked it, she liked it. Yeah. yeah. What does she think about your characters? Um, she likes she I don't think she's read everything I've written, mm -hmm. um, but what she has read, she's enjoyed, which I mean, is really like she would never read horror or, or even sci fi or crime. Some of the other stuff I write, that's not really her kind of her kind of stuff, but she likes it. Yeah. yeah. Now, often, you know, kids are influenced by their friends. You know, you get together and watch a certain genre of movie or, or exchange books. Did you have a group of friends who liked the same sort of books or horror that you did? Um, not really. When I was a, like a like a little kid, I like I, I was also really big into comics. I mean, I still am. I'm a huge comic geek. But yeah. um, so I had a lot of friends that read comics, but but horror, not really. It wasn't until I was an adult that I you know I found the other weirdos out there. <laughs> I, it's interesting that you call them weirdos. Uh, I find that horror writers 
have they go somewhere in their head <laughs> that I I don't I can't go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you definitely have to be. You know, I, I know some people who want to say it's like therapeutic, but it, I don't yeah. even think it. It's not for me. It's just it's not like <laughs> I, I need to get out these demons. You know, it's like nothing yeah. like that. It's just yeah. It's just what can you imagine really, and where can you go with that imagination? I guess. Now, I want to talk about um, all these crooked streets, but um, I noticed that you've got the space between houses sitting here. I do. That was, um, I really enjoyed oh, that. Thank you. And just remind our audience what it's about. Um, so it's a short story collection, horror stories, um, kind of all different subgenres mm -hmm. of horror, really kind of runs, runs, runs across the board with uh, the different kinds of stories. And um, yeah, it was it was the first thing I wrote. Um, and so the first book that came out and it is the one that it's been sold out for a long time. So uh, it's, it's about time to bring it back. So it will be back in the new year. Um, a, a brand spanking new edition. So um, and good luck and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And good luck with it. It really is. If you're into your kind of writing, <laughs> the, the horror genre, it is really captivating. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, all these crooked streets. I really enjoyed this uh, as well. I mean, I'm not a horror reader. And, you know, when I sort of had to read horrors, I thought, oh, crumbs. But I must say, what is what makes the difference is the writing. Well, in all these crooked streets, um, and I think you really you can see the writing difference because it's actually like the three stories in there are, are crime based stories. But being a horror writer, the way I, I approached it compared to the other two writers in the book writing their own stories was, you know, I, I really wanted to create atmosphere. I wanted to create dread, the, the things that would be in a horror story. So I, I kind of approached it like a horror story, just instead of a monster, it was crooks, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, tell me about your story in this book first. Sure. Uh, so my story is called Sugar's Last Dance. Uh, it's about a, a stripper who's working uh, at a strip club that's kind of on the outskirts of town. There's a, a blizzard happening. She's she's actually too high class of a stripper to be working at this dump, yeah. but <laughs> she's burned all her bridges. Um, and Cause she's quite a character. Yeah. And, and on this night, she's basically planning on robbing the strip club owner. She knows the combination to a safe. He's out of the club. Um, but of course, some some shady characters come in looking to do a deal with this guy. And she kind of just falls right in the middle of it. And it all spirals. Does it ever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, people will be surprised at the ending. I, I think so. Um, you know, I, I that you don't was give it away, of, right? But <laughs> but it was kind of a, a gray area that ending, and I think it was, yes. you know, because I I could see, depending on how you feel about certain characters, you could take it as a positive or a negative. Mm -hmm. So, did you like her? Um, I think so. Um, she's not the greatest person. Um, you know, she she certainly makes a lot of bad decisions. She's she's pretty greedy. Um, but I, I felt like I, I could relate to her yeah. at least. Um, so that made it easier to write her. And I mean, you know, you know we all feel like we're owed something. So I, I think in, in that way, I, I was projecting myself into her a bit. So tell me briefly about the other two stories. Sure. So the other two stories are written by uh, friends of mine. Uh, ben Van Dongen wrote one of the stories and then Edmund Gagnon wrote the other. Um, the whole reason we wrote the book was because we were going to work with Ed, who is a crime writer, um, like strictly a crime writer. So and we knew we could be more flexible in what we write because Ben likes to write sci fi. Um, so Ed's book is very much a police procedural kind of story. It's actually set in Windsor. It's a cold case. Um, it's a it's a Windsor detective trying to solve something that happened a long time ago. And uh, Ben's story is, is a really kind of uh, about a photographer that's dealing with like a, a whole bunch of sleazy people, um, crooked counselors and stuff. I mean, I, I'm probably not so far from reality. I was going to say there's a lot of reality <laughs> yeah, in this. <laughs> yeah, his is really similar to mine in a lot of ways. Um, the the fun thing about the way the book's laid out is that it goes my story, um, Ed's, and then Ben's, I believe is how we have it. But they're all different. They're all the same amount of words. They're all the same, very, roughly the same size. But like my story is very... It's all takes place over a couple of hours and then, you know, Ben's is over like days and mm -hmm. uh, Ed's is over weeks, you know, so it's like kind of a different kinds of a way the stories are being told. What's interesting for, and what people would enjoy is that they'll recognize a lot of places. 
Yeah, in, certainly, in certainly an Ed story. Um, he, yeah. he loves to use like like in my story, I kind of just pictured this club existing on the 401 somewhere um, yeah. along the 401 outside of, you know, close enough to Toronto, but not really in Toronto. Yeah. Um, um, Ben's is in like a fictionalized Windsor. But yeah, Ed went full in. He just was name dropping locations yeah. and streets <laughs> and people and whatever he could throw in there. <laughs> Um, and I, I think uh, sort of that always uh, for a local audience, that it's kind of cool. Yeah, certainly when we when we do signings and stuff in Windsor uh, and people buy the book, they they always they love that. They love that they recognize those places. Now, what's it like to co-write? Um, well, it's in, in our case, like we each wrote a separate story. Mm -hmm. So we had we all were working on the same timeline, but we weren't working together. Um, I've I've never actually written a story with somebody the same story. I imagine it's probably a nightmare, though. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wrote a book with my husband, so yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still together, so that's great. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. After twenty years, <laughs> uh, do you have fun? I do. I I love writing. Um, you know, I I, I hate like I hate the the process of like sitting down and like having to create something. But like while I'm doing it, and then once I've done it, I'm I'm very proud of it, and I feel good for doing it. So I, I do. I have a lot of fun when I write and create. Do you watch horror films now? Oh yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Uh, pretty much every day. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm always watching horror movies yeah. all the time. So you're always immersed. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, just just because I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just what I would do if I was writing or not writing. I'd still be watching them every day. So what's next? Uh, well, I have my debut novel because I haven't written a full length novel yet. Um, so it's actually out with a few publishers right now. Um, I'm waiting here back. I did get a request for the full manuscript from one of them. So hopefully I hear something soon. Um, but otherwise, I'm just plugging away. I'm about 70,000 words into the second novel. And uh, once that's done, I'll start number three. And all the Crooked Streets available? Uh, yeah, it's available. I mean, it's, it's obviously on Amazon or anywhere online. Um, pretty much any bookstore, if they don't have it, they can order it. So it's pretty much everywhere. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. We'll take a very short break. And when we come back, you'll meet Margaret McMaster. And we'll talk about her very interesting young characters. Don't go away. Margaret McMaster is a Kingsville writer who's published numerous books for middle and elementary school readers. Her books include Carried Away on Lucrish Days, great title, which was nominated for a number of awards. She also authored the Babysitter Out of Control series of books. Margaret has recently released her latest book titled Eight Days in Dumbo, and we're about to hear all about it. Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. Good to be here. Now, uh, first of all, what attracted you to writing for young people? Well, I think part of it is I'm writing for my grandchildren. And uh, as they've gotten older, uh, the books have uh, moved ahead with them. So now uh, my oldest uh, granddaughter and my niece are 12 years old. So they were, um, you know, they, they actually worked with me with the book. So it was, it was good to have readers, um, you know, to look over things for me. And yeah, so I would say that it's been my grandchildren. And are they enjoying your book? Yes, yes. And each one of them has a book dedicated to them. So. Now, your first, was it 2008? Yes. You published... Carried uh, Away on Licorice yes. Days. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. About the, and it's such a great title. About what the book is about? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the book was a result of a hobby farm that we owned uh, outside of Essex. And we had... Uh, a uh, very ornery horse there, and he had a pet goat, and uh, we we bought them <laughs> to be, um, you know, friends and companions for each other. And uh, we had so many experiences that I really wanted to get those down on paper. And then we were on a trip to Chilliwack, BC, and I found the setting because uh, there they had uh, an arena where and they, lots of local kids participated in a rodeo every year. And so I knew that's where I wanted to set it. That's how it all started out. And it's won a number of awards. Yeah, yeah. Which awards? Uh, well, it was, um, let me see, uh, what, what awards now? Uh, the It was long listed for the Canadian Library Association's Book of the Year Award. And it was shortlisted for the Hack and Tack uh, Children's Choice Book Award uh, out east and the Rocky Mountain Book Award out west. That's terrific. Yeah, it was good because the last two were 
uh, children's, um, the children judged the uh, books. And uh, yeah, so. Wow, now yeah. that's an award worth getting. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. and, and now, the series I loved, your babysitter books. Tell people about your babysitter books. Uh, well, the babysitter books center around Mrs. Cherubottom, the elderly babysitter, and uh, her charge, Stuart. And uh, she's a little eccentric, to put it mildly. And um, I don't think his parents really realize how unusual she is. <laughs> but she uh, takes him on a number of adventures. And there were six books in that series. It really was fun. You know, even as an adult, you could read those books and really in, enjoy uh, the shenanigans. And I could imagine reading it, you know, to a child or having a child sort of read it with you, a young person. And uh, it was such a lot of fun. You know, uh, that's kind of interesting because I've heard comments from parents that they'll be passing their daughter's or son's door and they can't hear them inside laughing, <laughs> you know, which is great. It's the it's the best thing. And there's a reader in Atlanta, Georgia, who has read the book over 12 times. What you know, a compliment. So, yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, a comfort. Uh, you know, it's there's not that many really humorous books for children out there. Uh, it's hard no. writing humor for, for children. And uh, yeah, I think they really are interested in how Stuart is going to get out of all these scrapes that Mrs. Cherubottom gets him into. Yes. And you know, it's interesting that you talk about children and humor because children often laugh at things and you think, how was that funny? <laughs> <laughs> and then other times, I mean, you think something is hysterical. And then they look at you as if to say, are you nuts? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when children laugh, it really means yes, something. It really does. Um, so let's talk about eight days in Dumbo. First of all, what's Dumbo? Dumbo is the area of Brooklyn between the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges. And it stands for down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Does it now? Yes, it's an acronym <laughs> for that. Why Dumbo? Like, well, um, actually, I just became interested in Brooklyn, and uh, the, the author, Emma Straub, has a bookstore there called Books Are Magic, and Samantha Brown lives there, the travel writer, and uh, I don't know, I was just watching a video on them, and I thought, gee, this looks kind of interesting. I'm going to, um, you know, just explore mm -hmm. this, and then I uh, discovered that it has this amazing history, and I used that history, uh, pulled in the Revolutionary War in it, in, in the story, Phoebe and her, his, her friends are doing a project on the Revolutionary War and uh, and how things turned out in Brooklyn. So, Have you ever been to New York? I've been several times, yes, but oh. I didn't make a special trip for that book. Uh, most of the work was historical research for it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us about the characters. And I know that you have a tendency to give us too much information, so you said. So um, I'm going to make sure that you don't give the whole story okay, away. Okay, good. All right. Um, so give us a summary, and then there are a few things I want to ask you about. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the uh, story uh, starts out with Phoebe, who is embarrassed by, <clears throat> I guess you could say, her, her arch enemy or her, I don't know, her nemesis, mm -hmm. Serena, at school, uh, who blabs to her during the cafeteria break that her mother's been writing a blog, um, which she's which is featured every embarrassing moment of her life uh, since she was born. And Phoebe has no idea. Uh, she really hasn't been paying any attention. And she's really not sure why Serena is um, irritating her like that. Mm -hmm. um, the blog kind of disappears from the story until we need the users, the subscribers to the blog later on in the right. story. And uh, yeah, that all came about because there was, um, I knew about this writer in Great Britain who, uh, she was a feature columnist with a newspaper. I think she had a weekly column and uh, she used to write about her family life. And when her son was 16, he became a drug addict and she wrote about it and he disowned her and oh moved out of the house. Now everything's fine now. I mean, this was quite a mm -hmm. while ago and he, he stopped using drugs and, and they get along fine now. But I, you know, the question, um, it was kind of a what if question, you know, what, what, what if you found out that your parent had been writing something that you didn't know about, you mm -hmm. know, so that's how it started. 
I often think, you know, you see parents posting everything on Facebook. Yes. And every photo under the sun. And, you know, when I read this, that I was reminded of how frequently I see my friends, whether it's children or grandchildren, and see, uh, I wonder what yeah. those youngsters will think m many sure. years later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there are four wonderful, pivotal changes in this book. First of all, when you go to uh, one of the characters, you change from like a narrative style to poetry. Mm -hmm. Why'd you do that? Well, um, first of all, um, Phoebe speaks in her voice, which is first person. And uh, I then had to switch to a 40-year-old's perspective. <laughs> okay. And um, a four-year-old with very limited uh, vocabulary. And I wanted it to stand out. And I wanted to slow the reader down uh, because Phoebe's interactions are snappy and yes. fast. And then all of a sudden it slows down for him. And so that's why the change. I, I really wanted a contrast. It is really clever, I have to tell you. Oh, thanks. It was very clever. I thought, I wish I'd thought of something like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next one is on page 140. It's a bit of a shocker. It's a big shock. Okay, what is the big shock? <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's on 140. On yes. <clears throat> It's the revelation about Serena. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Um, part of the story is, um, I guess, um, discovering really what's behind people's motivations and doing things. And I think that Phoebe probably comes to a better understanding as to mm -hmm. what was motivating Serena to be mean to her in the beginning. And yes, it is shocking. And um, it also, the the results really show how her friends pull together. I mean, her friend, frenemies, frenemies pull together, yes. you know, to, uh, <laughs> to, to help her out. Okay, the next one is on 163. And that's, uh, it goes back to Peter, I think. Oh, yes, it goes back to the character and the poetry. There's quite a revelation that comes out of that as well, because you begin to realize. So one of the characters is a little fellow who gets lost. Mm -hmm. Peter and, Philby. Yeah. And then um, I can tell you when you get to page 163, uh, you're going to get another shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you realize that I don't know what's on page yes, 163. I, I, I do realize, <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure out how, how, to, I... how to get there without you, to, uh, without <laughs> us giving away your wonderful shocker. Um, in, in, you begin to realize exactly where he might have been, right? Mm -hmm. um, with the character in the diner, mm -hmm. right? Yes, Peter, uh, just to recap here, Peter uh, is having breakfast with his mother in the diner. Um, the reason it's called Eight Days in Dumbo is because this all takes place over eight days. And we have Phoebe's story during those eight days, and then we have Peter's story during those eight days. And Peter disappears after he has breakfast with his mother in the diner. And he's gone for three days. And there's a, a missing child alert out for him. And uh, everybody's looking for him and all the, the news. He's featured on all of the news. And uh, yeah, the, and, and you know, part of the thing is that um, the reality of what's happening to Peter is in stark contrast to what everybody is worried about. Yes, you know, and uh, it's almost as though he's in a different world. That and he, you know, he doesn't even realize what's going on. Uh, if you told him what was going on, he probably wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. No, you know? and probably wouldn't understand. No, probably wouldn't. Yeah, you know. and then. On page 211, 211, when Phoebe, uh, you, we, you understand that Phoebe knows exactly what happened. Yes. Yes, you do. And, uh, and yet, um, I think we know how uh, Phoebe's going to react, having already read situations that she's had to deal with. And uh, we know what kind of person she is. And I think if her friend London 
had figured it out, it would have been a different, she would have acted differently and it would have been a different ending. Yes. But keeping in Phoebe's character, she had to do things a certain way. Yeah. And that really resolves the situation for all of the characters in the book. And also, Mrs. Philby has to make this incredible choice as to what she's going to do at the end. And, uh, you know, that it's not something that anybody else could do or make her do. Uh, it was just, I, I thought it was a... I mean, I, I know you think I wrote that, but I honestly, I'm just following the characters around, writing yeah. down what they say. <laughs> <you know? laughs> it really is a journey, isn't it? Um, it's a, a, a tremendous journey for a young person to take through these characters. I hope so. Yeah. Do you like the characters? I love those characters. Actually, uh, after I got finished that book, I decided to write another one. Uh, a second book that doesn't take place in uh, Brooklyn. It takes place in Nashville. However, um, so has Phoebe become a, uh, a country singer? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's gone with her grandma Sylvie, who is attending the Vanderbilt University uh, reunion for her nursing class, and uh, and her grandmother grew up in Nashville, so they have family there that they're staying with, and it, on a, what used to be an old uh, tobacco plantation, and. Um, while they're there, something happens regarding the Peter Philby story in Brooklyn. There's a development, an unusual thing that happens. Uh, so that's it. They kind of, the whole story comes back again. So when do you expect we'll be able to read that um, one? You know, and I'm only a uh, third of the way through the writing, so that'll be another year. Well, let us know when it happens. <laughs> okay, and I good will. Luck. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. It's been wonderful. Well, there is always so much to talk about and never enough time. So I'll just thank my wonderful guests, Christian Laforet and Margaret McMaster. Thank you to Brian Sweet, our co-producer, and Gary Glass, who works very hard to make everything look and sound great. Big thanks to Tony Toldo Jr. and the Toldo Foundation, and also to Neil and Tina Quaring. I'm Veronique Mandel. And the last thanks, of course, always to you. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again right here on Scribes and Songsters. 